all of you who are joining us on Facebook Live. Today we want to worship our Lord, Jesus who died for our sins, who's been raised from the dead, who has ascended into heaven, who's given us back one day to judge the nations in righteousness. We worship a risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming to you today as Kuta International Christian Church, but we're coming to you from Taipei, Taiwan, where Evie and I are living right now, until such a point as Bali opens up again for international tourists, and it's safe for us to move our family there. <clears throat> and it's a blessing to come to you every Sunday on Facebook Live. We're coming to you Bali Facebook Live, and we're coming to you also on my own Facebook, Timothy Conkling. Um, and we're so thankful that many of you join us <clears throat> each, each on Facebook. And we're thankful that so many of us are in good health in spite of the challenge of the global pandemic. We're also grieved today to hear about how many people in the United States especially have the virus, including our president, uh, the President of the United States, Donald Trump and his wife Melania and many other government officials. And so our hearts go out to all those around the world who are struggling with loved ones who have the virus. But today as we meet together, we want to remind ourselves that in spite of the challenge of a pandemic, in spite of all the challenges that are going on in our lives today, we look to the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That love that cannot separate us from Him no matter what happens in this life or in the next life to come. So as we begin our service with prayer, let's do so with an expectant heart, um, opening our hearts to what God has for us today and asking for His blessing and His help. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord God, we come into your presence with joy, with thanksgiving, with praise, because through Jesus Christ we can enter into your presence. And we ask today, Lord, that you would fill us with your joy in the midst of a fearful time and situation in our world today. We ask, Lord, that in Indonesia, all those around the world, all those in the United States who are suffering, with this terrible coronavirus. We pray that you would touch them and heal them, including President Donald Trump and his wife Melania and the many other government officials in the U.S. who have the virus. Lord, we all know someone who's been touched by this virus, and we ask that you would bless our loved ones, you would heal them, and you would prepare them for what you would have for them in their lives. God, strengthen us today as we come to your word. Strengthen us to know how we can approach you in a new way. Strengthen us to know how it is we can have a relationship with you. Strengthen us to know how it is we can better love one another in the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who's joined us today from around the world. Thank you for those who are coming to us from Australia, those who are coming to us from Bali, those who are coming to us from New Zealand, those who are coming to us from the United States, those who are coming to us from Taiwan, those who are coming to us from the Netherlands. Around the world, Lord, people have joined together on the internet to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, let your word illumine our hearts today and give us strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wish that we could be together in the same building, in the same city, in the same place. But that's rather impossible given the situation. So this is what we have to do in the meantime, and we'll make do with what we have and be so thankful. Imagine what the Apostle Paul could have done if he would have had access to the internet and everything that we have today. So we want to make use of all these technological resources to be able to bring people together in Christ from around the world. Even when the church building opens up in Bali, we want to think about how we can continue to reach out to the world, maybe through continuing our Facebook Live um, every Sunday or other means. But this whole coronavirus crisis has given us an opportunity to think about what's the best way that we can reach people with the gospel. And right now, 
the best way is right the way that we're doing it through Facebook Live. So thank you again for joining us and welcome to all those of you who have just joined us on our greeting time after we've had a chance to praise our Lord in song. We're going to sing two songs at the beginning of our service today. We're going to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high and shine Jesus.
Jesus, display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story, shine on me, shine on me. and see if anyone else has joined us and has greeted us on Facebook Live at KICC Bali or at Timothy Conkling at Facebook Live. Ev, did you find anybody on KICC Bali? Well, let's see. I, ah, some folks have joined the watching uh, without posting a comment, so okay. I'll read those. Uh, Abdi El Ari is watching. Uh, Roma Lubis is watching. Kevin Wright says, hey all, God bless everyone. Kevin and Fenny. Uh, did Treville? I don't know if I pronounced your name right, Rick. Rick from Florida. Okay. Yes. Rick is watching. Tom Hudson is watching. Great. Good morning. Or from good evening in your case. Massachusetts. <laughs> well, the Bible says greet the brethren by name, and so we try and do that by reading out your names. And thank you, those of you who have joined us today. I'd like to invite our children to come around um, you're a little close. Have your mom and dad call you in into the room. Um, I have a passage I'd like to share with you from the Bible, but let me ask my wife. Evie, would you share the picture? Oh, okay. I'd like to talk to you about fear, and I'd like to talk to you about love. And the amazing thing about love is that where there is love, there is no fear. Now, in the world, sometimes people fear God, and they fear that God won't accept them, or they fear that they won't be saved, or they fear that on the last day they won't go to heaven. And so in the Bible, in 1 John chapter 4, we find that John talks to us about love and fear. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfect, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Well, every Saturday night, I have this ritual of going to Shimunding and finding the, all the people who bring their reptiles. And I play with the reptiles. And I find every Saturday night that there's two groups of people in Shimunding. There are those who fear the reptiles and there are those who love the reptiles. And it's so funny because those who have the love for reptiles, they have no fear. But those who have fear of the reptiles have no love. So it's, it's a great time every Saturday night to go out there and to take the reptiles, people in the crowd, that actually the reptiles love them. See that the reptiles actually love, then they start to love as well, and they lose their fear. So I pick up a monitor lizard. Kids come around, and girls come around, and guys come around, and they get really scared because the lizard looks like. A but I look, I hold him, and I look at him, and people see you, 
And I'm like, yes, he does. And they're like, oh, I'm afraid. And I said, well, he loves you too, come pet it. And then they come up and they pet him on the head and they see that, oh, actually, reptiles can love. And then they no longer fear again. Last night I did something that I don't usually do. I usually go and play with a monitor lizard. But last night um, I got a little bit more ambitious. So I thought that I'd play with some of the larger snakes. So at one point, and I posted this as a video on my Facebook, so you can go and look at it later, but I had a big, huge, I guess it was a python, um, uh, around my neck. And he was so nice and such a, a nice snake. And I had him around me and I had him around my neck because I loved him. And I knew that he loved me and I had no fear. But I saw that people around me were full, full of fear. And as a pastor in the church, that's what I see. I see that there's a lot of people running around that have fear. And why do they have fear? Because they don't realize how much God loves them. And if we had the love in our heart, we would have confidence in the day of judgment. So brothers and sisters and friends and children, realize that God has shown you his love by sending Jesus Christ to die for your sins. And if God loves you so much that he took away your sin, then you don't have to feel guilty when you stand in his presence. And when you're filled with the love of God, you're free. You know what you're free to do? You're free to love others and to not fear. We love God because he first loved us. And last night, it took a group of reptiles to teach me a little bit about the love that God has for all of his creation and especially the people that he has made in his image. The perfect love of God casts out all fear. Sometimes as a child or even as an adult, you wonder, does God really love me? Am I really saved? When I die, will I go to heaven? And when you think about that, it can really mess you up. It can get you pretty depressed. I remember <clears throat> a few times in my childhood growing up where I was quite depressed over thinking that I might not go to heaven. But what does God want us to know today from his word? That his love will cast out that God won't accept us. God loves you. God has shown you that love in Jesus Christ. He'll never let you go. And you don't need to fear him when you stand in his presence. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great, awesome, wonderful love that you've shown us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we don't understand it. That's how sinful we are and we're tempted to run away from you and to be fearful and not even to want to pray. We're thankful that you can assure us today <coughs> that we can have confidence in the day of judgment because your perfect love casts out any fear that we have of punishment. Lord, thank you that you've punished Jesus rather than us and that the holy sacrifice has already been made. So teach us, Lord, how to love, how to not live in fear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to share another passage. We're talking about Christian humility. And last week we talked about humility and we saw from Philippians chapter 2 that there is an attitude of humility and it comes from the example of Christ who was willing to give up equality with God in heaven to empty himself to come into the world to be made like a man and then to die on the cross for our sins. And we saw that humility consists in having the mind of Christ and then learning from Christ and all that he has to share with us. In another passage. So last week I called it the power of Christian humility from Philippians chapter 2. This week I want to talk to you about the practice of Christian humility and what does it look like as we stand before God and as we talk to ourselves and as we talk to others. What does the practice of Christian humility look like? So I'll ask you to take your Bibles and I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. 
beginning in verse 9. This is a very famous parable. Um, it's called the Pharisee and the Publican. What's a publican? You know, some, some people hear that word and they think it's like a republican without the re. Um, so what is a publican? A publican is a tax collector. So this parable is about two different kinds of people. And it's about a Pharisee who was a religious leader of the day, who was Jewish, and then it was about a tax collector. So beginning in verse 9, listen as I read the word of God. And Jesus also told this parable, trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like the other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, wasn't even willing to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. <clears throat> I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbles himself shall be exalted. And they were bringing even their babies to him, so that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to some. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child, shall not enter it at all. When I was growing up, my father used to tell me that there are two kinds of people in the world. I grew up in the South during the Civil Rights era, and there was a lot of what we call racism. Racism is when you uh, treat other people badly because they're not like you. Maybe their skin color is not the same color as yours is, or their, their nationality isn't the same as yours. Well, I grew up in the South in Florida in the 1960s, and there was this problem of racism. And so my father used to always say, son, there's two kinds of people in the world. Those who love money and use people, and those who use money and love people. Well, when we come to the Bible, we see that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who the Bible says are just before God, acceptable to God, and there are those who are unjust. What we have is a picture of who is the just and is that the Pharisee actually thinks that he is just that he's really unjust. And then the tax gatherer wouldn't dare think that he's just before God, but actually sees himself as a sinner. And instead, God says to him, he's the one who actually is righteous before God. This is a very, very interesting passage. And <clears throat> I want to ask you the question right as we begin our message today. Which kind of a person are you? Are you a Pharisee? Or are you a publican? Are you someone who is self-righteous or someone who is humble? So let's look closely at our passage today. In verse 9, Jesus told the parable, and he said that 
he told the parable to certain people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. There was a point to the parable, and the parable was Jesus wanted to get the attention of the people who had two characteristics. Characteristic number one, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And characteristic number two, they viewed others with contempt. Well, why was it that the Pharisees trusted in themselves that they were righteous? Well, they trusted in themselves because they knew that they were God's chosen people, God's chosen race, and they felt that just by being a Jew was good enough, and therefore they were righteous, and everyone else in the world was unrighteous or not acceptable before God. So one of the things that we see in our world today is that sometimes there are people who think that they are naturally better than everyone else because of their ethnic identity. There are some people who think that because they are from a certain country that they're better than those from another country. I've had an opportunity to take a lot of mission trips into mainland China. And I'm not sure if you realize this, but China is an English word that describes the nation of the People's Republic of China. But in Chinese language, the word for the country is called Middle Kingdom, Zhongguo. And that idea of China and the Chinese people being the center of the world and the center of the universe is something that I have encountered on my mission trips. In fact, sometimes when I'm taking a taxi, especially in the city of Beijing, and have opportunity to talk to the taxi drivers, I've gotten around to talking about this concept, and I found that there's a very strong sense of national identity that even some of the people who are from China, living in China, think that they're better than everyone else in the world because they come from the Middle Kingdom, the center of the universe. On one occasion, I had an opportunity to talk to a taxi driver about Jesus, and I was explaining that Jesus was a Jew, and that Jesus was born into a Jewish family, um, and he was born in Bethlehem, and the taxi driver kept on shaking shaking his head, and after I got done sharing the gospel about Jesus and all that he's done, and how he died for our sins and he was raised from the dead, <clears throat> the taxi driver said to me, that's impossible. And I said, why is that impossible? He said, if God were to send his son into this world, he would definitely have sent his son into China. In other words, the idea that Jesus, the son of God, would be a Jew rather than a Chinese was something that was too hard for this taxi driver to comprehend, and he rejected the gospel because he said, Jesus didn't come as a Chinese person. Well, that's the kind of ethnic superiority that the Pharisees had at the time when this parable was written. The Jews trusted in the fact that they were God's people, that God had spoken to them through Moses, that God had given them the Ten Commandments and the law, and so the Jews also had the, the right of circumcision for all the males, and so they trusted that they were more righteous than the Gentiles and everyone else just because they had this sign of circumcision. Some people think that because of their religious background or because of their ethnic identity that they're better than everyone else. And that is just not true. It is not true that anyone is better than someone else just because of what their ethnicity is. So the Pharisees had this problem. They saw themselves as, as being better. And not only that, they trusted that before God they were righteous. Now let's take a look at the parable and see how these concepts come, come out. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself. One of the characteristics of a Pharisee is 
is that they don't actually talk to God. They talk to themselves. In other words, their prayers don't make it out of the room because they're talking to themselves. There's been so many times as a pastor when I've heard somebody pray, and it doesn't sound like they're talking to God. It sounds like they're talking to the other people in the room. And often when that happens, they're talking about what the wonderful things that they've done. When we approach God, we approach God, not the other people in the room. And one of the characteristics of people who are unrighteous before God, but who think that they're righteous, is that they pray to themselves. And what do they say when they pray? Well, they say this, God, I thank thee that I am not like other people. They think that they are superior to other people. And not only that, they can't connect with the other people because the other people are sinners. Now this is fascinating. Notice the list that he mentions. The Pharisee says, I'm not like the other people, the people who are swindlers, the people who try and cheat people out of the money. I'm not like the people who are unjust. I'm not like the adulterers or even like this guy over here. This man is not praying to God. He's talking to the tax gatherer and he's saying to him, you're not righteous. This wasn't a prayer. This was a condemnation. And one of the things that I see in this verse is that the problem with the Pharisee is, is that he could not identify with other sinners. He didn't see himself as being like a person who had committed sin. And that's one of the marks of a Pharisee. You think that you're better than everyone else, and you think that, that you're not a sinner because you haven't committed the particular sins that someone else has committed. I know people who haven't committed adultery, so they think that they're not sinners. I know people who haven't stolen from, from anyone, so they think they're not sinners. I know people who go to church every Sunday, and they think that they're better than the people who don't go to church, and that's what they're trusting in for God to accept them, the fact that they go to church. And so they think that they're better than everyone else because of something that they do. Well, we see this in the behavior of the Pharisee. I thank thee that I am not like other people. If you have the spirit of the Pharisee in you, then you're going to have a really hard time relating to other people. And you're going to have a really hard time relating to them in their sin. I do a lot of what's called evangelism. In other words, conversations with people about the Lord Jesus. And every time I have a conversation with someone, even if they're very different from me, I try and look for a point of connection. The Pharisee mentions, I'm not like you because I didn't commit adultery. Well, I can connect with someone on the idea that all of us struggle with purity in our eyesight and purity in our mind before God, even if we haven't actually committed adultery. The Pharisee mentions swindlers. Well, I may not have cheated anybody out of money, but I certainly think sometimes in my heart of hearts that I can say, like all of us say, that I've loved it too much. The Pharisee mentions other sins as well. He mentions being unjust. What does he mean by that? Un righteous uh, before God. Well, we run into people all the time, maybe that aren't Christians, that were not raised in a Christian home. They didn't have the blessing of knowing Christ from an early age and coming um, from a church background. Well, I can relate to them and point out to them that even though I went to church from an early age, I wasn't a Christian until that point where God spoke to my heart and showed me that I was a sinner. He mentions that the man is a tax gatherer. In other words, he came from a bad occupation. He came from an occupation that was known as being an evil occupation. Well, today, what would that look like? Um, 
we don't have evil tax collectors usually going um, to people's houses, but what do we have? Sometimes we have people who misuse their governmental position to hurt others. And that's true in almost every country. Oh, you're a government official. Oh, you're a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Oh, you're a bad policeman, as some people think in some countries because they fear the police because there's often police corruption. For example, in Bali, recently there was a Japanese tourist that was um, treated uh, unjustly by the police and they charged him a big fine and it wasn't proper and the policeman who did that then got in trouble. Well, there are different categories of professions in every generation that are considered as being unrighteous. So the Pharisee draws attention to that and he says, that's not my occupation. Look at me. I'm a religious professional. And here's the problem. Often, when someone is in professional ministry, they start thinking that they're better than everyone else who has a secular job. Now, that's the spirit of the Pharisee. And that's what we need to watch out for today. So what are the characteristics of the Pharisees? Number one, they brag about their ethnic identity. Number two, they pray to themselves. Number three, they don't relate to other people who are sinners because they don't think that they're like them because they don't commit that particular sin that the other sinners have committed. You know, if you cannot relate to other sinful people, then you will have contempt on them rather than compassion. And that's exactly what Jesus says at the beginning of the parable. He this parable is told, uh, well, actually Luke says this, this parable is told to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed other people with contempt. That means they looked down on other people and they thought that they were superior and they were better than everyone else. Have you ever been like that? Have you ever thought that you were better than someone else? Because you didn't do that. Or you didn't do this. That's the spirit of the Pharisee. And every time you have it, you're not identifying with sinful people. And not only that, you're not having compassion on the sinful people. Jesus would hang out with the people who the world saw as being sinners. And he would tell other people that he didn't desire sacrifice. He desired compassion. Christ showed us what compassion was like because he associated with the people who the world judged and said they were too bad to even hang out with. Christ had compassion when he looks at Jerusalem and he weeps over it. Christ had compassion when he says the world is like a harvest field. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest, send out laborers into the harvest field. And Christ tells his disciples that right after he had gone on a ministry tour where he had healed many of the people who came into contact with him. And he showed his compassion and his love by going around from city to city, from place to place in Matthew chapter 9, and healing the people who were sick. Jesus' response to sinful people is compassion. Why do we not have compassion? <clears throat> we don't have compassion on people because we do judge them and we think well they don't deserve compassion why because well look at what they did they're responsible they're culpable as they stand before God they did something wrong so instead of us connecting with the people who are like that because we're all sinful and we all sin and fall short of the glory of God in some way instead of connecting with those people we think that they're better now I'm going to use a rather sensitive illustration at, at, at this point <clears throat> I've noticed on the internet that there's people right now who are showing a lot of contempt to the people of the United States government who have gotten the coronavirus. There's not compassion. There's not love. There's not prayers. There's only judgment because there's some people who wear masks 
and they're viewing with contempt the people who didn't wear masks because they think, well, I would always wear a mask. Well, sometimes the president and his wife and other people in the administration didn't wear masks. I'm not saying that was right. What I'm saying is, is that if your response to someone getting the coronavirus is contempt rather than compassion, you're not being like Jesus. Jesus had compassion on all people who were sick. And we should pray for the people who are sick. That doesn't justify people not following the correct protocols that the, that the government has, has set up through the CDC on how people should practice social distancing and wear masks. I'm not against that at all. In fact, I'm very pro-mask. And um, I'm often sharing that with people when I look on their Facebooks and I see that there's people who are having a lunch with someone and they take off their, their mask because they want a selfie and they're right next to the other person. This is wrong. And some of you have asked me to address it. Some of you have asked me to speak out uh, about it, even amongst our KICC Bali congregation. And I'm taking this opportunity right now to talk about it. In the midst of a global pandemic, for you to take your mask off and sit close to someone and take a selfie is just wrong. But having said that, we still have compassion on people, people who are sinning in ways that we don't sin. That's what a Christian does. They have compassion on other sinners. They don't judge them and view them with contempt because you're not like them. <clears throat> so it's not only sometimes as we view people with contempt that we say, oh, I'm not like them. It's that we say that we're righteous before God because we're not like them. That God accepts us because we don't do those things that they do over there. So the problem with having contempt on other people rather than compassion is, is it causes you to trust in yourself and to really think that you are better than everyone else. But notice, it gets even worse in, in this passage. It's not just that the tax collector tells us everything that he doesn't do. It's not just that he prays to himself and says, I'm not like other men. Listen to this. He talks about what he does do, and it's because of what he does do and what he does practice. He thinks he's righteous before God. He brings up two things in verse 12. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. He draws attention to two <coughs> religious obligations in the time <coughs> when the Bible was written. One was fasting, the other one was tithing. The Jewish person and certainly the Pharisees were supposed to give a tenth of all that they got to the Levites. They were supposed to tithe. Um, tithe means take a tenth and then give it to the Lord and to those who were, who were serving in the temple. So the Pharisee says, I give tithes of all that I get, and I fast, I pray, I stop eating, and because I do this, I'm better than the people that don't fast. I've seen this so much in my Christian life, that there are people who think that they're better Christians or better than everyone else because they got up earlier than everyone else to have their quiet time, their time alone with God. And I've, I've been in conversation so many times where somebody made someone else feel worse because they didn't get up early and have their quiet time. I'm not saying we shouldn't get up early and have our quiet time. We should get up early and, and have our quiet times. But then we don't need to compare ourselves with others for what's part of our religious practice. So this Pharisee was looking at two things that he did and said, because of this, I'm righteous. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I get. You put this whole picture together. We see a Pharisee who doesn't see himself to be like anyone else because he doesn't commit the same sins that they commit. We see a Pharisee who has no compassion upon other sinful people. Instead, he views them with a contempt. And what do we see? We see a Pharisee who trusts in what he does in his religious practice to make him right in the sight of God. 
I know people who think that they're right in the sight of God simply because they read their Bible, simply because they, they go to church, simply because they pray, simply because they go to confession, and they trust in what they do. Now, if you are self-righteous and proud and like the Pharisee, you will be a person who talks about what you've done to cause you to feel like you should be good enough to stand in the sight of God. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying when I talk about righteousness in the sight of God that because the Bible says that all of us are sinners that I think that there's no goodness in the world. Yes, there is goodness in the world. There's even goodness in people who are like bad people. There's badness in all of us who are, who are Christian, and there's goodness even in people who are not Christian. And that's because of God's common grace and because we've been made in his image. But when you consider the question of how much goodness is necessary to be able to stand in God's sight, the answer to that question is God does not grade on a curve. He demands perfection. And the only way that a human being can be considered perfect and have the righteousness and the goodness that is necessary to stand in God's sight is if that person trusts that the record of what Christ did was credited to their account. And then you can stand righteous in God's sight. But if what you're trusting in for God to accept you is anything that you've done, oh, I go to church, oh, I was raised in a Christian family, oh, my family card says I'm Christian, so I'm going to heaven. If you're trusting in something like that, your ethnic identity, your ID card, if you're trusting in your religious performance of going to church or the fact that you've prayed, then maybe you're really not a Christian. After all, you're just like the Pharisee. <clears throat> because God is telling us this particular parable because he wants to humble us all to realize that though there is goodness in human beings, the goodness that, the, that there is there is not good enough to stand in God's sight. And that's why we need Jesus. That's why we need all it is that Christ's has done to be credited to us. The fact that he takes away sin to be credited to us. The fact that he takes his goodness and his perfect righteousness because he lived a perfect life and he gives that to us. That's what we need in order to stand righteous and just and holy and acceptable before God. And anything short of that is not good enough. So here's the Pharisee trying to come into the presence of God, and he's doing this great comparison, and he's saying, God, you should accept me because I'm not as bad as this other person. And if that's the way you're thinking today, I can assure you you're not saved, and you need to come to Christ, and you need to trust him and to allow him to forgive you and to give you his righteousness. So the spirit of the Pharisee brags in prayer and goes before God from a standpoint of pride. I am better than other people, and I have done these things, so you must accept me. That's the spirit of the Pharisee. Is it in you today? You look, look at other people and think that you're better than them, and you can't relate to them because they're so sinful. If that's your spirit today, then you need a touch of Christian humility. You need to practice Christian humility. You need to allow the Christ who is humility to come into your life to teach you about it. And listen to what Christ teaches us through the other example. We don't just have a Pharisee in this pa passage. We have the tax collector. We have the publican to teach us. If you'll give me just a moment, I have to call up a different translation of the book. <clears throat> So I'd like to talk to you now about the other type of person, not the Pharisee. I'd like to talk to you about the tax gatherer, the publican. Verse 13, but the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. What do we see about the tax gatherer? Well, the first thing we see is is that he doesn't see himself as being very good. 
He was standing some distance away. He felt like the other person was better than him and he needed to keep his distance. And as he began to think about praying, he thought, I, I can't even lift up my eyes to God. Who am I to look up into heaven as if when I look up into heaven, God's looking down upon me. I can't do that. Instead, he beat his breast. <sighs> Have you ever seen someone go to prayer like this? Beat their breast, and the only thing he could say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. There's a picture in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. We have the picture of someone who models the spirit of the tax gatherer by standing in the presence of God in humility and being convinced of your sinfulness. That's what the tax gatherer says. He asks God to be merciful because he sees himself as a sinner as he begins to think about standing in the presence of God and praying. What happened to the prophet Isaiah when he stood in the presence of God? How did this affect how he saw himself before God? Well, let me share this story with you. It's from Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord, this is what Isaiah says, sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. When Isaiah stood in the presence of a holy God, he saw the holy beings. He saw the seraphim flying around. They have one song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. These seraphim are, have no sin. They are perfect beings that stand in the presence of God to glorify him. But even though they are perfect, in the face of God's holiness and in the face of God's glory, they still showed their humility because with two of their wings, they covered their feet so that no one would see their feet. My mother had a thing against feet. She would never let me wear flip-flops or sandals because she, she always told me, don't ever let anybody see your feet. And so to this day, you'll never catch me in sandals or not too often. Maybe when I go to the beach occasionally, I'll, I'll I will wear sandals. Well, her conception of feet growing up was feet are dirty, feet are bad. When the Old Testament, feet were dirty, feet were bad. That's why Jesus Christ took his towel and washed his disciples' feet. These holy, perfect, wonderful, beautiful, glorious beings known as seraphim, they covered their feet. They covered their eyes. And with two, they flew. They covered their faces because God was too glorious to look at him face to face. They covered their feet as a symbol of humility. And then they flew with two of their wings. What did Isaiah experience when he saw this? He's like, I'm undone. I am ruined, he says. And what does he say? I'm a sinner. I am a man of unclean lips. I have a dirty mouth, and I live amidst a people of unclean lips. Everybody around me is the same. We don't use our words in ways 
that God accepts or expects. Isaiah knew his sinfulness, and he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. And it wasn't until that point where the, where the seraph picks up a flaming coal with tongs to point us to how Christ took the wrath of God on the cross for us. And then he touches Isaiah's lips and says, You're forgiven. Your iniquity is, is atoned for. It's taken away. Because God has redeemed you. God has atoned for your sin. Well, brothers and sisters, if you want to be like the tax gatherer when you pray, you go into the presence of God just like the tax gatherer did, and you say, I'm a sinner. Lord, be merciful to me. You don't brag. You don't say, I'm so great. You don't say, oh, I've gone to church. You don't say, I was raised in a Christian home. You don't say all, all those things. You say, God, please, have mercy on me. What is mercy? It's undeserved kindness. I don't deserve you to show me your kindness. I don't deserve your forgiveness because I am a sinner. But please be merciful. So when the person goes to pray who has this attitude of perfect humility, they don't trust in themselves. They trust in the mercy of God and they know enough of God to know that God will be merciful to everyone who reaches that point of saying, Lord, I have sinned. Lord, I am sorry. Lord, I am wrong. Would you please just be merciful? I don't deserve it. It show me your mercy. I follow different people on their Facebook. Some are Christian leaders. And one of the Christian leaders that I follow is a man in the U.S. named Tim Keller, who wrote a very popular book called The Reason for God that was um, first on the New York Times bestseller list list at one point. And Tim is a very famous pastor who started a group of churches in the New York City area um, called Redeemer Presbyterian Church. And now there's many branches of Redeemer Church around um, New York City and around that area. So Tim has a lot of people following him on his, on his Facebook. And he said something about God's grace uh, last, last night. And I was reading the comment section of what people said. And, and one man was talking about how, how he didn't feel worthy. He said, I struggle to be worthy of God's grace. That was an exact quote. I struggle to be worthy of God's grace. And it was late. I should have commented. I didn't. I'll probably go back and comment on that man's comment later. But what I thought when I saw that comment, what I thought is, this man is not a Christian. Because we're never worthy of God's unconditional love and, and acceptance that we don't deserve. We're never worthy of it. We always have one prayer and one prayer only when we stand before God. I am a sinner. God, be merciful to me. You're never worthy. Never worthy of the Lord's grace. So the first characteristic we see of the one who actually is accepted by God, who is shown to us in the example of the tax gatherer here, is that he senses his sin in the presence of God, just as Isaiah did. The second thing he does is he shows others he is aware of his sin. He beats his breast in front of other people. He has a sin meltdown where he lets other people know, hey, I have sinned. And through his prayer of admitting the fact that he's a sinner, he shows everyone else around him that he's aware of his sin. He confesses it in the presence of others. He doesn't try and hide his sin. He doesn't deny his sins. Well, I didn't do that, like so many people do. There's a sad story circulating on the internet, and I'm going to mention it, of, of a prominent Christian leader who came to Jakarta many, many times during the years that I was in Jakarta and even after I left Jakarta. His name is Ravi Zacharias, and he recently passed away um, because of cancer, and that was a terrible thing. But Ravi had a very successful and prominent ministry of leading people to Christ and speaking to large groups of people. And on his last night in, in Bali, which was just a few years ago, it was just uh, less than two years ago, so many people came to church to hear Ravi 
Zacharias because he's a big name Christian preacher. Well, now after he has died, all these stories have come out about him being an immoral person um, who did immoral things, who sexually harassed women, and I won't get into all the details that you can find in the Christianity Today article. And this is a horrible thing. And I was talking about this with one of my friends in the United States the other evening. And he asked me the question, he said, how is that possible that someone with such a wonderful ministry as Robbie Zacharias would be committing those sins and falling into that sin? I said, it's very simple. Because these super famous Christians get put on a pedestal. And the higher they get on being put on a pedestal on the side of men, the less likely they are to actually confess their sin or to confess their sin and their temptations to other people and ask other people to pray for them. In other words, they set themselves up as being better than everyone else when actually they're not and actually they can even be worse. And so what happens is, is whenever we get away from the, the tax gatherer's example, whenever we get away from being willing to show others that we're aware of our sin, then we run the risk of being someone who falls like Robbie Zacharias. And it's a terrible thing. I'm always wary. I'm always careful. I, I always beware of people who name their ministries after themselves. That's setting themselves up for a fall. So one of the characteristics, one of the characteristics we see of the tax gatherer who received God's mercy was that he showed others that he was aware of his sin. He didn't try and lie about it. He didn't try and cover it up. He wasn't afraid to confess to others that he was a sinner. What about you? Are you covering up your sin? You don't want anybody to find out about it? Or are you willing to confess it, forsake it, repent of it? Take it to the presence of God and say, Lord, I am sorry. I am a sinful person. Please have mercy on me. Please forgive me. Please give me the strength to repent and not fall into it again. That's what we have in the humble example of the tax collector. The other characteristic is that he specifically asks for mercy from God. He's not afraid to ask it, and he actually asks for mercy before God. And the last characteristic we see of the one who actually is righteous before God is that their whole salvation comes through a standpoint of humility. <clears throat> As my father said, there are two kinds of people in the world today. There's the just and the unjust. There's the proud there's the humble. There's the publican and the Pharisee. What kind of person are you today? God wants all of us to be like the tax gatherer, on our knees, beating our breasts, admitting our sins, calling out to him for mercy, knowing that he is a merciful God. And whenever we call out, he's willing to show us his mercy. Some of you need to do that today. Some of you have been trusting in yourselves, trusting in your religious background, trusting in the fact you were born into a Christian family, trusting in, in, in the fact that you beam in on the online service or you actually went to church, but yet you've never reached that point of being like the tax gatherer to admit your sin and to cry out before God for mercy alone. If you stand in the presence of God and try and pray, in any way other than God be merciful to me, I am a sinful person, then you've missed the essence of how it is that any of us can connect with a holy God. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God detests the spirit of the Pharisee, but yet he welcomes the humility of the tax gatherer. Some of you need to become like the tax gatherer today. You need to say to God for the first time, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we come into your presence, we do say like the tax gatherer, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
Lord, we're not good. We're not acceptable. We haven't done enough goodness to be acceptable in your sight. So the only thing we can do, Lord, as we come to you in prayer is to ask you to be merciful because we have a confidence that you are that merciful God and you give mercy to everyone who calls upon your name. We thank you, Lord, that you do forgive everyone who asks for forgiveness, no matter what it is we've done. So, Lord, bless the people who are calling out to you today. Bless those who are calling out to you for the first time. Bless those who need your merciful touch. Bless those who've been living in secret sin. Bless those who've been afraid to confess. Bless those <coughs> who have been proud with the spirit of humility shown in the practice of the publican, the tax gatherer, in this passage. Lord, show us how to be the humble people you want us to be so that we can find the grace that you want to give. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me invite you to go to the comments section now and to take a moment and share any prayer requests that you might have, and then we're going to be able to pray about those things. And so, Evie, let me ask, um, has anyone shared a prayer request already, or do we need to wait a few moments? We need to wait a few moments. <clears throat> Please put your prayer requests in the comments. It allows us not only to pray for you right now, it allows us to pray for you throughout this week, and it allows everybody who joined in on the service or who goes back to watch it on the Facebook Live, it, it allows them to see your prayer requests and to pray for you. And Mary S. is asking prayer for the people of Ambon Maluku. They're having difficulty with flooding because of raining. Rivers are overflowing. Okay. And I, we've had a report from uh, our, our helper Asep in the Jakarta area as well in West Java that They've had a lot of rain there. However, I haven't heard about flooding in Jakarta, although that often mm -hmm. happens as well. Um, yes, and uh, Mary S. and Ari are also sharing. We, we need to pray for uh, the finances of our church. Uh, they've posted the different information on the accounts of how you can give to Kuta International Christian Church. Um, and we ask that you would continue to keep the ministry of our church in your prayers and also in your giving because as you as you give to the church it allows us to support the work of the Lord through our church in Bali and also to care for the people who are in special needs so thank you to all those of you who, who have given is there any okay there I think there are some more um and Malati Rachel that's Sarchi mm -hmm. says please pray for my mom from Edo uh, in the Netherlands, let us pray that people will not be persecuted for sharing their faith. Uh, religion should not be a license of hate, speech, discrimination, and violence. Yeah. Donna Smith is shared. Please pray for my friend Alan's mom in London in a hospital, and pray for Jill and her son on lockdown in Denpasar. Pray for them that not to have fear. Okay. Kevin uh, saying we need prayer as a Christian <clears throat> so we can have wisdom in the Holy Spirit when advising, mm -hmm. uh, advising others, other Christians, I suppose that. I think there's continuation of Kevin's comment. <laughs> he says advising non-believers, and this is from Fenny actually, so we can apply what we learned in this service to give impression for Christian humility. Okay. All right. So Fenny's full request is that uh, we as Christians would have humility when uh, talking to non-believers. Okay. Uh, one is JJ who says, please uh, pray for her father. Anything else? Uh, Mary S. says, please pray for... Grace, Grace Ellen, Ellen Simon. Simon and her friends. Did you read that one already? No. <laughs> okay. And her friends who will have a concert on October 31st. Ah, that's great. It's, okay. it's to help people during COVID-19. Okay. Um, Grace I hope, Ellen Simon. I hope when they have the concert that they practice social distancing and people <laughs> wear masks. So if you're planning on going to that concert, 
please wear a mask and stay two meters away well, from, from everyone else. Hopefully also they can uh, live stream that one. Uh, live stream the concert so that um, people can watch it online. I would that hope. That would be great because yes. we would like to watch it online also. And Rita has said thank, thanks and Thanksgiving prayer for um, her brother who got coronavirus and is now mm. positive after the third test in 15 days. Oh, wow. And there will be a fourth test. So keep on praying for him. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry to, to hear that. So we want to pray for you right now, and we want to ask you to pray for us um, as well. And let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we go into your presence, we come to you as sinful people. We ask you to be merciful to us. We pray you will bless us simply because you're a merciful God, not because we're good, but because Jesus was good and he loved us enough to take away our badness and give us his goodness. So Lord, we want to lift up now the, the prayers that we have on our hearts. And so we lift up before you uh, the, the people in Ambon, Maluku, who are having this difficult time with flooding. Lord, we just ask that you would be merciful to them. Lord, we also pray for Melody Rachel's mom, that you continue to, to heal her and strengthen her. Uh, we pray for the Netherlands, that uh, people may share their faith without experiencing persecution and discrimination. We also pray, continue to pray for the growth of, of churches and Sunday schools, ministries in, in the Netherlands and Europe, where there has been some falling away and coldness in the last few decades. Lord, we also pray for JJ's father and uh, we want to lift up uh, Rita's brother as well and pray for <coughs> health mm -hmm. and healing for everyone. Lord, we pray for Donna's friend, Alan, and Alan's mom in London, who's in a hospital. And we pray for her friend, Jill, and their son on lockdown in Nepasar. Lord, we ask that you would keep them strong, keep them safe, Keep them healthy. Lord, we lift up this uh, concert that's upcoming and all the preparations for it by Grace Ellen and her friends. And um, Lord, we pray that you'd protect them as they practice, that if they uh, get together to practice, they will be safe. And also that the concert will be will be safe for those who attend. We pray that, that uh, they would be able to raise money in your name to help people uh, who, who have needs at this time. We also want to remember to apply your word that we read today and learn more about humility, apply and practice more of humility in our lives, especially as we're talking to non-believers in our workplace or sharing our faith that, Lord, we would um, do so humbly and know that, um, let people know that we are uh, aware of our own sinfulness and that we need Jesus and not because we're better than they are. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray um, for Rita and we pray for her brother. Lord, we ask that you would completely heal him of coronavirus. Lord, we also lift up Judges, the Father, again, we ask for your mercy in this situation. Lord, we pray for um, the ministry of our church. We pray for the general fund and, and the social care fund that we would continue to be able to meet all of our obligations each month in the church and also to bless all the people who are in special need. And Lord, we just lift up um, everyone in, in that situation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Kevin, and we thank you for, for Finney, and we do ask for the wisdom uh, of the Holy Spirit um, so that we know how to speak with unbelievers. Uh, Lord, we pray for Donna and uh, her plan for the week, and also for... Uh, 
for her son's birthday, I think, that, uh, that the Lord would control the situation and help them and bless them. Um, so Re Rita uh, mentioned that her brother's test result is already negative after third test. So mm -hmm. that's a praise. So actually, um, he's recovering. We can be thankful. Amen. Well, Lord, we thank you for this day that we've had today to lift up the needs of congregation to you. We thank you for this time that we've had to be reminded that all of us are sinful and we can't put ourselves on a pedestal. We can't pretend like that sin is in everyone else and it's not in us. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be like the tax gatherer who found mercy rather than like the Pharisee who was not justified before you. Lord, would you be merciful to us? Would you show us how it is we need to approach you? And would you pour out your grace upon our congregation and our world during this difficult time? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to sing. Um, we're going to sing a song of response called Holiness. Take my life. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.